Today I will review a basic but a very important topic in neurology. A good understanding about the upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons along with their lesions is extremely useful in localizing neurological lesions and as a neurologist this information, this knowledge helps me a lot on a day-to-day -day basis. This topic is also a favorite exam question in medical and nursing schools as well as in various entrance exams. So make sure you really understand this topic thoroughly and if necessary go back and forth a few times to make sure that the concepts really sink in. Now let me start with a quick drawing of the motor pathway and then we will discuss this in a little bit more details. Okay, so we have the initial drawing ready. So for the voluntary movement of skeletal muscles, the message first has to come from the primary motor cortex. So let's suppose that this is the primary motor cortex. So the message first has to come from the primary motor cortex to either the cranial nerve nuclei in the brainstem or anterior horn cells in the spinal cord. This is done through the upper motor neurons. So let's draw the upper motor neurons. So th let's imagine that this is the primary motor cortex. And from the primary motor cortex, the corticospinal tracts and corticobulbar tracts travel down. They travel through the internal capsule, go through the midbrain, go through the pons, which is not shown here, at the level of the medulla, the fibers cross. Some fibers stay on the same side, others cross. They travel down in the anterior and lateral spinothalamic tracts and eventually synapse in the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord. So these are the upper motor, neuron, upper motor neurons that are heading towards the spinal cord. Okay, so this is the upper motor neuron. Now let me draw the lower motor neuron from the spinal cord from the anterior horn cells and I will use a different color. So let me use the blue color here. So these fibers, they travel from the anterior horn cells and then they travel down, travel out of the spinal cord and then eventually end up in the muscle at the neuromuscular junction. So these are the lower motor neurons. So upper motor neurons started from the corticospinal tract from the primary motor area, travel down and synapsed at the anterior horn cell and then the lower motor neurons traveled all the way to the muscles. So that is for the, for the muscles. Now if you think about it, there are other upper motor neurons. So let me draw those in a different color now. So I will take the red color here. So these are now the upper motor neurons 
that are traveling to the face. So these will travel down through the internal capsule, through the midbrain, and these would eventually synapse at the level of the pons for the face. So the pons is not shown here, but I will end it up over here showing that this is synapsing at the pons. And then the lower motor neurons will travel, and we will use a different color for that. So the lower motor neurons will travel. Let's say that we use this color. So these would travel not through the medulla, but through the pons. And these would end up on the facial muscles. So these would be the lower motor neurons for the face. Let me just draw a quick figure here. So this is the face. So this, these are the lower motor neuron fibers to the face. Okay, so I hope this is clear that there is this upper motor neuron that travel down to the spinal cord and from the spinal cord the lower motor neurons travel to the muscles and then from the motor cortex there are also fibers that travel down to the brainstem those are the corticobulbar tracts carrying the upper motor neurons and from the cranial nerve nuclei those are further carried in the lower motor neurons to the muscles of facial expression and other skeletal muscles. Okay, so that was the initial in, initial discussion that we've had. Under the normal conditions, the upper motor neurons regulate the lower motor neurons. So if the upper motor neurons are damaged for a certain reason, there will be certain changes in the working of the lower motor neurons, and we will discuss that. That is the next thing that we are about to discuss. One of the favorite exam questions is, how do you differentiate upper, upper motor neuron lesions from lower motor neuron lesions? So let's talk in different domains and see how different domains are affected. So let's start with the tone. The tone will increase with upper motor neuron lesions, and it will be more flaccid and decreased with lower motor neuron lesions. So if you want to visualize an upper motor neuron lesion, think of a cortical stroke. So if a person has a left hemispheric stroke, they will have a paralysis on the right side. The left side of the brain controls the right side of the body because of the crossing of the fibers, crossing of the corticospinal fibers at the level of the medulla. So there will be spasticity. So in people with stroke on the left hemisphere, there will be spasticity on the right side. If a person has a stroke in the motor area of the right hemisphere, they will have spasticity on the left side. Now, to visualize a lower motor neuron lesion, think about a person who gets an injury to his or her arm, leading to severe damage of the radial nerve or severe damage to one of the nerves. When there is a damage to the nerve, it gives you a lower motor neuron type of a picture. So whereas in upper motor neuron lesions, such as a stroke, there was spasticity, in lower motor neuron type of a lesion, such as injury to a nerve, there is flaccidity or decreased tone. In terms of reflexes, if a person has a cortical left hemispheric stroke, there will be hyperreflexia, meaning exaggerated reflexes, brisk reflexes on the contralateral side. So with a left-sided injury, left cortical injury, there will be brisk reflexes on the right side of the body. If a person has a nerve damage, such as a radial nerve damage, they will lose their triceps reflexes. If a person has damage to the musculocutaneous nerve, they will lose the reflex to the biceps or the reflex would be decreased. So nerve injury gives you a lower motor neuron type of a picture, a stroke or a cortical injury gives you an upper motor neuron type of a picture. Let's talk about the muscle mass now.
initially with a stroke you do not see wasting of the muscle it takes some time because of disuse atrophy meaning a person is not using the muscles enough a person starts getting atrophy on the side that is affected by the stroke so if it's the left hemisphere there will be some disuse atrophy on the right side and it is not limited to a s one group of muscles it affects pretty much everything that was regulated from the other side of the brain whereas if there is a nerve damage the loss of muscle mass will be in the distribution of that specific nerve so if the median nerve is damaged the muscles innervated with the median nerve will be will lose mass not muscles innervated by the radial nerve and vice versa so that is important the atrophy is in the distribution of the involved nerves with lower motor neuron lesions fasciculations means that there are some twitches in the visible twitches in the muscles which are not seen with upper motor neuron lesions but may be seen with lower motor neuron lesions one test that we call plantar reflexes is tested by scratching the plantar surface of the sole and extensor plantar responses are suggestive of an upper motor neuron lesion flexor or absent plantar reflexes are suggestive of a lower motor neuron lesion so there are certain neurological conditions that cause upper motor and lower motor neuron types of lesions so patients who have strokes involving the cortex cortical brain tumors brain abscess multiple sclerosis all of these tend to cause upper motor neuron signs which we've just reviewed uh, previously conditions that cause lower motor neuron signs include traumatic neuropathy carpal tunnel syndrome and ulnar neuropathy diabetes can cause neuropathy leading to lower motor neuron signs so patients who are diabetic if you test their reflexes you'll find that their reflexes are absent or diminished or decreased patients with a condition called gillen barre syndrome present with numbness and tingling in their hands and feet but this is when it involves the motor system it produces lower motor neuron types of findings so patients will have absence of reflexes so somebody who comes in with a quadriparesis and has brisk reflexes you start thinking about a possible spinal cord involvement if somebody comes with quadriparesis with absent reflexes you start thinking about conditions like gillen barre syndrome or other neuropathies there are certain conditions that give you a mixture of both upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron signs so if somebody has a brain stem tumor tumor that involves the pons tumor that involves the midbrain these patients will have upper motor neuron signs by involvement of the upper motor neuron tracts that pass through the brain stem as well as because of compression on the cranial nerve nuclei they these will also give you lower motor neuron signs similarly if a person has a traumatic or a compressive myelopathy means compression of the spinal cord below the level of the trauma there will be upper motor neuron signs at the level of the trauma because nerve roots are involved a person will have lower motor neuron signs a condition called ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis also known as Lou Gehrig's disease has a combination of upper motor neuron as well as lower motor neuron signs so i guess i will stop here i hope you understand the concept i will suggest that you review this video a few times so that you can basically understand the concepts and think about different neurological conditions that cause weakness and try to classify whether those are upper motor neuron lesions or lower motor neuron lesions i will appreciate if you can share this video with your friends and colleagues and in the comment section if you can give suggestions for future videos thank you so much